and this is after much brouhaha in public discussion. First, the United States proposes that in the TPPA, tobacco be recognized as a unique product. It's kind of oblique language, but it's referring to the public health implications of regulating tobacco. Secondly, the United States proposes still to eliminate tobacco tariffs. And they promise to contact all the countries with whom we, we do not have free trade agreements yet to get them to reduce their tariffs to zero, including Vietnam. On the other hand, the United States proposes that there be an exception for regulating tobacco. And so the question there becomes, is it a meaningful exception? Does it really safeguard tobacco controls like the ones that are now being challenged under international trade rules? So here's the exception. Actually, here's a summary of the exception, which you can find on USTR's webpage. It would allow health authorities and TPPA governments to adopt regulations that impose origin neutral, science-based restrictions on specific tobacco products or classes in order to safeguard public health. Let's take that apart. Health authorities. Well, this would not include other kinds of legal authorities, such as customs, which would be federal, licensing, which would be state, taxation, which could be state or local, and consumer protection, which could be state or local. Think about the kind of tobacco controls you have in Maine and how many of them are issued by a health authority as opposed to these other kind of authorities. When Kay Wilkie, the chair of IGPAC, asked USTR the question of whether state and local governments are covered, the answer was very interesting. The first answer was, yes, they're covered by this exception. However, we should note that state governments are less likely to issue their tobacco regulations through health authorities, so probably most state laws on tobaccos would not be covered. But that's for the second reason, or actually I'll get to the third reason. Um, adopt regulations, it's not the usual language of a trade exception that refers to adopting or enforcing certain measures, so it appears not to cover enforcement of existing measures. Does that mean only pro measures that are enacted subsequent to the ratification of the agreement? That's what I think it means. So anything on the books has no validity? It covers regulations. This may be the, the biggest issue. Regulation does not mean legislation. It means that legal thing that a department issues, not what you adopt at the legislative level. So most state and local tobacco measures are legislated. Um, tobacco controls in other, other countries are legislated. U.S. Tobacco Control Act, the act passed by Congress in 2009, which was recently challenged in the WTO, we lost, by the way, that was legislation. So this proposed exception wouldn't have even prevented the United States losing the WTO case. It's designed only to implement future law regulations written by the U.S. De um, Food and Drug Administration to implement that 2009 law. This was a question I asked in the comments I sent to you, but does that mean that regulations that are written to implement legislation are also invalid? No, it means the regulations are covered, but the legislation itself might not be. So I'll give you an example. In the 2009 Act, there's very broad delegation from Congress to the federal agency, and Congress says, agency, here's a basket of things you can do. You can set restrictions on tobacco sales or tobacco marketing or the contents of tobacco products without defining a standard for regulation in any of those areas. So the, the legislation itself delegates authority, but it doesn't adopt a standard. So that legislation is not likely to be challenged. It would be the agency rule that actually puts the teeth into the tobacco companies. That's what would be challenged. On the other hand, there was a piece of the 2009 law that actually set the rule, and that was, thou shalt not use tobacco flavorings. Here's a list of 90 flavorings. These are prohibited in tobacco products, 90 flavorings. Watermelon, strawberry, chocolate. I mean, it's like Cocoa Puff list of things. These were flavorings designed to make cigarettes palatable to kids or other tobacco, tobacco gum. I mean, all kinds of exotic and, and disgusting products that were made to taste sweeter and milder and stuff that kids would want to consume. Kids, teenagers, young adults, uh, 
the, the, the problem with that legislation was that it excluded menthol while covering everything else, including clove flavoring, and that's what led to the trade dispute. And the WTO ultimately found that protecting menthol, but then knocking out the Indo Indonesian clove cigarette flavoring was uh, de facto discrimination. Let me bring you back to the language. This exception covers measures that are origin neutral. Now this is designed to avoid the problem in the clove cigarette case because Congress didn't single out Indonesia for less favorable treatment. They just said we're going to ban clove flavorings. Sort of an accident of classification, right? Um, the problem with origin neutral is that just like the national treatment rule, it could mean de facto origin neutral, neutral as well as it could mean literally origin neutral. So if you want to make this clear, you would say facially origin neutral to get around the arguments that, it, that discrimination could be uh, interpreted as de facto or effective discrimination. Science-based. Uh, this will be the subject of numerous law review articles. What does it mean science-based? The problem with this reference is that it could be interpreted a number of different ways. The first is the way that the USTR, the US negotiators, this is what they think it means. This is what they want it to mean. It means you have to have some science. And they base this on an interpretation of different language in the WTO's agreement on sanitary and phytosanitary measures, the, the agreement that covers food regulations. And in that agreement, reference to science and risk assessment has required just a rational relationship, really not too distant from the way a US court would look at a statute. So if that interpretation prevails, this is, a, this is a helpful exception. However, it could also mean preponderance of science, which is an issue in tobacco regulation because tobacco companies generate a flood of science anytime they want to litigate a case or contest a regulation before a decision maker. And they have scientists who will say, not that tobacco is safe, but they will say, your measure is not proven to work. Your measure is likely to drive people into the black market things like that. And so there'll be conflicting science on the books. So does the trade rule mean that there has to be a balance of scientific opinion? Or that somehow the science in terms of the regulatory side of the argument is better science, more relevant science than the arguments on the tobacco side of the, uh, side of the case? Uh, it could mean, as, a, as the panel suggested in the recent clove cigarette case, it's whatever science the panel finds persuasive. In fact, there's actually a rule that panels must follow to listen to all the evidence and make up their own mind as to what they think is persuasive. This exception does not direct them to favor the science coming from one party as opposed to the other. Um, <clears throat> finally, it, it's pretty clear that it requires more science than the existing public health exception because that's been interpreted to mean uh, simply a rational connection. The European Union argued in a case involving imported tires claimed between Europe and Brazil that the Brazilians uh, could not be allowed to ban tires, retreaded tires, from entering their market. It's all about mosquito control and tires sitting in waste dumps. Um, without scientific evidence, studies that proved that banning the tires at the border would actually reduce mosquitoes and mosquito-borne diseases. Whereas Brazil said, no, all we need is a logical concept for how this law should work, and the WTO agreed with them. So the WTO rejected a science-based argument in the Brazil tires case with respect to the need for scientific evidence. And here, this exception, this exception is requiring the very argument that the Europeans lost in the Brazil tires case. That's enough. I could go on. There's more details about how this works. Um, question is, what would you like to do about this debate? Are there any oversight questions that you think might be more effective coming from you? On the one hand, you've got the tobacco companies pressing to be left alone. You've got screaming and yelling coming out of states like North Carolina, Virginia, and Kentucky from the tobacco growers who very much want their tariffs reduced so they can expand their markets. And they're, they're really banging on the administration for risking American jobs if they don't extend this, the benefits of zero tariffs. So, that's one side of the argument. On the other side of the argument, you've got pub public health advocates like tobacco-free kids, 
the American Medical Association, the American Academy of Family Physicians, and six other academies or uh, organizations of doctors in the American Cancer Society, the American Lung Association, they're all ganged up on the other side. The administration's in the middle looking at this as a one of those moments of, oh boy, I get to stick my finger in the electric socket and get shocked by both sides. And so as you can see, they've come up with a proposal that tries to split it down the middle. <clears throat> Does that make sense to you, your politicians, some of you? So it's almost like all the different ways that government tends to operate to address problems at a local level are being undercut. In the clove cigarette case, Congress did exactly what you described. They confronted the issue that tobacco flavorings were being used to expand the market. They saw all these flavorings coming that were addressed to kids. So they considered banning everything. And guess what? They got pushed back from the tobacco industry that said, wait a minute, there are 35 million Americans hooked on menthol. I'm not sure quite what the number is, but a large percentage of the smoking population, which is addicted to back to tobacco, prefers their dose in a menthol cigarette. <clears throat> so they were pushing back on really, they, they had a public health argument. They said, you'll be forcing people off of menthol and they're addicted. This is the industry saying people are addicted and so it's a bad thing to take away their menthol. I, it, it, the, the, the argument has to do with uh, disrupting the, the addiction balance in the U.S. smoking population. So because of that and because of the sheer economic weight of the industry that didn't want to see menthol banned in the United States, Congress said, all right, we're going to ban all this new stuff the chocolate cigarettes, the strawberry cigarettes, the watermelon cigarettes, all the stuff. It's clearly aimed at kids. What do we do with cloves? Well, kids slightly prefer cloves to menthol. They did the marketing studies, so there's a few percent difference. We'll put cloves in the box of stuff we're going to ban. And besides, nobody makes cloves in the United States, and so they weren't being lobbied. The Congress was not being lobbied by the clove industry like they were with the menthol industry. And so they did exactly what you described. They did an incremental change, responding to lobbying, which is what legislatures do. They compromised, and the compromise was, well, you think it was origin neutral with respect to cloves? That's the buzz about this decision. Um, it's the WTO basically saying, you've got to be logical and consistent when you adopt legislation. And it's not logical to ban cloves but not menthol. It's political, but it's not logical. They're making that distinction. Well, which logic prevails in this legislature? When the United States won a claim against Europe on banana trade, you didn't know America was the biggest banana exporting country in the world, but we are, because American company Chiquita Brands, based in Cincinnati, owns a number of fruit companies or has contractual relationships in Nicaragua and other places. And so, we won a trade dispute over bananas, and we put sanctions on English lithographs and German soap. So guess who lobbied the European Union to, to cave and make settlement with the United States? It was the people who were hurt by it. That's the way the sanctioning mechanism works. So that's a long answer to your question. There are sanctions behind the trade rules, and the sanctions lead to intense political lobbying to make the pain go away. Whereas in the case of the tobacco controls, there's no sanction. It's just a call to adopt these. If you make a commitment to adopt these measures because you want to for the public health of your own country. I sort of turn that question that you posed to the commission around and to you. <laughs> sure. And saying, what do you think is the effective role that a commission like this could have on this issue? Well, what if you think the exception is really very, very narrow, as I've described it as being, chock full of holes? Well, if, if you could make the exception robust so that it really did safeguard future tobacco regulations or legislation, including laws you might adopt, that's a different trade-off. How do you feel about morally and politically saying we're going to ask other countries to zero out their tobacco tariffs while at the same time giving every country enough space to adopt robust regulations that are designed to suppress tobacco consumption? So you all export as much tobacco as you can while on the other hand, we're going to encourage countries to develop their regulatory frameworks to suppress the trade that we're encouraging you to grow. The question is whether you think of tobacco policy as a main issue or a United States issue. If you're willing to think of it as a United States issue in which Maine is a stakeholder, 
having been party to the initial litigation in the master settlement agreement, then you might care that there are things that the tobacco companies have threatened that could be used against the United States as a whole. I'll give you an example. Philip Morris, when they filed their TPPA comments back in 2010, said, there are two countries that we're really pissed off at, Australia and Singapore. What do we not like about Singapore? Their legislature has given a broad grant of authority to their health minister to adopt regulations simply because it would promote the public health, regulations to restrict marketing of tobacco. And they're threatening to make that a point of litigation, and they're asking for TPPA powers to do it. Why else would they mention it in their comments to USTR about the TPPA? In 2009, the Congress delegated authority to the Food and Drug Administration that is practically identical to the delegation of authority from Singapore's legislature to its health minister. So if that argument works with Singapore, why wouldn't it work against the United States? The only reason I can think that they wouldn't bring the action is because they don't want to, uh, they don't want to make the issue that big. They don't want to kick a sleeping dog. They don't want to force the President of the United States to get off the fence and come down on the side of public health. So I think it's for political reasons they're laying back and they're picking on Singapore, not us. And the final argument is how much as Americans do you care about the smoking trends in developing countries? Our trading partners are starting to spend increasing percentages of their national income and their budgets on health services for cancer and other tobacco-related diseases. It's, the curves are going up, just like we, we experienced when the smoking rates were increasing here. So there are secondary economic considerations, but the, in the first instance, it's a, it's a political and moral kind of solidarity question. Do we, do we want to ask other countries to um, forego legislation that would effectively help them reduce smoking rates, as we have done, using different techniques. Um, there are some other oversight questions. Uh, you could ask, for example, are the U.S. trade negotiators complying with U.S. policy about how to negotiate a trade agreement? There is an executive order of the Clinton era that says, thou shalt not negotiate trade agreements that either promote tobacco sales or restrict tobacco rest restrict the ability of other countries to restrict tobacco, um, sales of tobacco products. The U.S. Trade Re I asked USTR negotiators how they felt about that, and they said, well, they don't think it really applies to them because it only means that they can't go out and promote tobacco products like in a trade show. Uh, you could figure that out yourselves, and if you think it's weak and could be improved, you could take a position on it. And say, I guess that, that would be my concern, Professor, because I'm very much opposed for us to go the other way on the tobacco products. And that, that really concerns me if it's going to weaken our stand on tobacco in this country, <clears throat> in the state of Maine, then I think we need to take a stand on, on, on it. Uh, I guess that is my big concern. That's why I was for putting tobacco on this list. So this proposed exception is sort of the classic compromise in many ways, is that, I mean, it try to have your cake and eat it too in some ways. Um, so another alternative would be to, I'm just putting this out for the commission to consider, another alternative might be to say we don't, you don't support this proposed exception and would advocate for tobacco to be carved out, is that the phrase, of the TPPA. Is, is that right or do I have that wrong? You have that pretty right. There's a mild and a strong version of that position. The mild version is, this exception doesn't work so well, it's chock full of holes. Fill all the holes. Cover legislation, cover all authorities, not just health authorities. Delete the science test and just, you know, allow countries to decide for themselves to adopt measures that restrict tobacco consumption or sales. Uh, make it self-judging, in other words. You could fix all those holes. It still is not as strong as it could be, the more robust version would be to say, take tobacco out of the entire trade agreement. It's really a special product. It really shouldn't be in this trade agreement. We're not saying government should do anything about tobacco except don't give it the benefits that every other company and every other sector is getting from the trade agreement. Hold it aside, do no harm, 